Hi everyone. So next let's talk about postmodernism in fine art photography. Now, a lot of people don't necessarily like, um, contemporary art. And a lot of it is usually because there's this idea that art is only supposed to be things that are beautiful. But as we've talked about, there are times when creating something that is not necessarily beautiful or aesthetically pleasing, um, has more, I mean, has, a, there's a reason behind it. There is some idea or, um, deeper thoughts that are going into creating something. And so it, a lot of times when people walk into like, let's say a gallery or a museum and they see something that they don't quite understand, they tend to first think, I don't like it. Um, a lot of times, especially with contemporary art, things that are like abstract, um, or like I said, not that beautiful are seen as bad art when really, if you take a little bit of time to understand the reasonings behind it, it becomes very beautiful. Uh, so if maybe, you know, you just haven't been exposed to that much art and thinking in this way yet, and that's fine. We're all on a learning journey. And I would de definitely say that, um, you know, take a moment to come to this webpage and watch this video called I could do that by the art assignment. They do a really great job of helping us really look beyond what our expectations are and look deeper into why people create certain art and the meanings behind it. Um, there are parts of this video that make me cry every single time. So I would definitely, um, I would definitely recommend you coming back and watching this. Now, uh, I'm not going to read through all of this because there's a lot of information here, but you know, we were in a state of modernism up into the seventies and eighties. And then we went into, um, you know, this more, uh, modern type of way of thinking. And this was against people such as the art critic Clement Greenberg, who believed art shouldn't be informed by personal experience, such as gender, race, or age, but purely on aesthetics like composition and media. And that only people with the right knowledge and training could understand. Now, of course, I mean, now we know that that's not true. Um, since then, there's been this huge push, starting with feminist art, to express ourselves, especially people who aren't considered the majority. Um, that is includes feminist art, um, Native American art, LGBTQ, African Americans, and especially people from other regions outside of Europe and the United States. For so long, and much of art history focuses on just. European art and, and well, for us in the United States art, but now art from all over the world is being created, um, well, not just created, but appreciated for their own types of views and what's going on behind it. So, um, now we are, what's we are in what's considered postmodernism. Although some argue that postmodernism is over history, art history, these things change with time. Um, but no longer do we have these really nice and neat little, you know, oh, this is the movement that's happening now or now, now everyone's creating all kinds of stuff. And it's really an exciting time to be alive as an artist. There are no rules really. Um, it's really just about creating something that expresses your unique ideas, your unique viewpoints of the world. So we're going to look at some of the many, many different ideas that are being explored through art right now. Um, and, and I would again, push you to think past what your traditional ideas of art are and try to open up and embrace some of these other ideas. Okay. So popular culture, uh, you might have heard of pop art. Now, for a long time, uh, pop art and stuff like that was considered a low art. And it was really, you know, some of you might have heard of Andy Warhol. They kind of pushed it into the high art region. Now, John Baldessari, Bal sorry, Baldessari, <laughs> um, he creates these images and he kind of 
brings these different images that have nothing to do with each other, but pulls them together in a way to force them to have meaning. Um, and a lot of people have talked about how it's in a way akin to quick cuts in videos. So it's really that he's asking us to relearn how to read in a nonverbal, nonlinear way. So for exa example, we have this kiss panic piece and um, we have some very different imagery coming on all around here. What does he mean by this? What are we pulling in? So he's using these guns as composition, pulling us in. He's put, he has a very soft, kiss happening in the middle of all this and a panicked scene coming down from here. So he's asking us to think about these things in a whole different way. Now, Richard Prince is a very controversial artist. Um, this is the series that he really got famous for, um, where he photo re photographed advertisements. So these started off as um, Marlboro, it was a cigarette company, um, advertisements that were in magazines and he took photos of them and then used them as fine art. People have gotten really mad about this uh, re-photographing type of idea because they say it's just stealing someone else's work. He didn't actually take this photo of this cowboy in the middle of the desert. He didn't take the time to set it up, um, set up the shot, the lighting, the actors, whatever, but he re-photographed it. Now the reason why he re-photographed it is what's most important here. He wants to point out that popular culture influences how we think of ourselves and how we act. And in this particular um, series, he was trying to point out masculinity and how masculinity is represented to us and why, you know, where we're getting these ideas from. And it worked. A lot of people still feel that the cowboy is the ultimate form of masculinity. All right, consumer society and everyday objects. So artists questioning consumption. Why are we buying things? What is the point? Um, and this can go really deep. I mean, this is something that I struggle with. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's, especially in our culture, it's all about what you own and what you buy that gives you meaning. And is that right? When really it's just to make a profit for other people. And at the same time, let's bring in climate change. Um, there's this idea where products are purposely made not very well so that they will break and then you are forced to buy more. It's called planned obsolescence. Um, and this is a huge issue. This is, this is basically only done so that companies can keep making products and keep selling them and keep making money instead of making the same product better so that it doesn't have to be bought as often. So there are artists who are questioning these things. Barbara Kruger is um, a very well-known artist and it's not just about shopping. We also have things like women's rights. Um, now, Sherry Levine re-photographed famous photos as well. This is very controversial, claiming that they are new artworks on their own. Very similar to um, Richard Prince, but she's actually re-photographing famous artworks. There's a lot of uh, arguments to go on around this work. <laughs> All right, now this is especially something that hits hard with photography. With photography, we expect a photo to be the truth. So, um, but we've learned that, you know, how you photograph, the light you use, the angles you use, the settings you use can speak about your subject. So, is a photograph actually a tr the truth or is it your truth or is it someone else's truth? Um, so representational art is in photography is really about questioning what we perceive as being realistic. So there's a bunch of different type of work in here. None of this is all going to look the same, especially when it's driven by an idea. But this is a really interesting one. Um, this is work by Vic Muniz, who, and he, there is a whole documentary on him. It was on Netflix. I don't think it is anymore, but you might want to search for it. It's called Wasteland, where he went to the largest dump in the world 
And um, he basically hired the people who were living in this dump and working in this dump um, to help him create these massive artworks by placing the trash that they've been collecting um, in to create these images based off photos he took. So first he found the people and he took a photograph of them. And then he hired her to help him um, get all of this stuff together and create this. And then the last step in the process was actually taking the photograph. Now this photograph, it gets printed huge and he has these really big uh, exhibitions in like New York City and Paris. And he actually took the people that he hired to do this to those exhibitions and gave them a part of his profits. Jeff Wall creates photos that seem to be truthful, but they're completely set up. And um, so he uses the conventions of documentary photography. And when I say conventions, those are like the, the rules or the clues that tell us it's a documentary photo. And he applies them to these setups to really, again, question what is truth? If you set something up to look like it's a documentary photograph, but it's not, is it still the truth? What is it? So, um, for example, in this image, dead troops don't talk. Um, at first glance, it looks like this horrific war scene, but as you actually start exploring what's going on, you have people playing <laughs> and, um, you know, people who are seemingly dead making funny faces and such. And so again, he's pushing us to think about what actually is truthfulness in photography. Um, Cassabier and Thomas Demand create these small scale models and photograph them, but, um, and, and they're a very eerie type of feeling. So here are like the finished photos. Now here is a behind the scenes photo. All right. So they create these little models and then flood them and take photos of them. And they're very beautiful in a way. These reflections are great. The lighting is beautiful, but there's just something off. Um, a lot of people see these and just think they're flood photos, but if you've ever actually seen flood photos, you know that there's all kinds of debris in the water. The, there's usually dirt that have, that's gone up from the, from whatever's been in the water. And so, um, yeah, again, forcing us to question what is real. This is another one. So that one was Casabier. This is demand where he again makes models of historically significant places. So for example, this one is Hitler's hideout, Bill Gates dorm room where he created his first, um, his first computer and L Ron Hubbard's hotel room, who, um, is the creator of Scientology, a religion. But the thing is, is that, you know, you look at these and you think, okay, what's the big deal? Once you know that it's supposed to, this is Hitler's hideout, then it's like, okay, new importance comes to this photo. But then you, uh, then you find out that it's actually a model. It's not even the real place. So again, there's this feeling of like, okay, what's the big deal to like, oh, wow, this is significant to wait a minute. This was a trick the whole time. So again, how does photography, how is photography seen as truthfulness? And is that truthfulness actually uh, manipulated? And again, more conventions uh, of documentary photography used to photograph functional architecture. Burned and Hilla Becker are famous for this work where they're looking at the, the differences um, as well as the similarities of things. Um, De Corsia, he, what he does is he uses document. He's basically documenting people in New York city, but by using light and angle, he creates what almost feels like film stills. Um, what he does is he sets up flashes on a street in New York city. And by knowing how to use these flashes and underexposing with the camera. So the background is really dark but then the flashes come in and light his subjects. It creates this very setup type of feel. 
These people didn't even know they were being photographed. They're just walking down the street and these flashes went off. <laughs> And these are the photos that were created. So again, are these actual film stills? What, you know, using the uh, rules of photography, but bending them in a way to make us question reality. All right, storytelling, always been huge. And Cindy Sherman is one of the most famous photographic artists um, that deals with storytelling. But she, what she got famous from, from the series, is she takes again the conventions the rules of um cinematography or videos of film and applies them to herself to create these characters so um she's creating she's basically talking about the ideas of how women are represented and the characters that they play so this is supposed to be like the classic you know, uh, small town girl and just shown up in a big city and being unsure of the world, um, a single mother struggling to make ends meet, um, you know, the classic Western damsel um, beauty in the, in the desert type of thing. And what's funny is that, um, you know, her work has been around for a long time. And so people have seen it, but maybe not realized what it was. And people swear that they've seen these movies. They swear that this is from a Western they've seen, right? So it's really interesting. And she's still creating to this day. All right, Gregory Crudson. So he takes... Um, he creates photographs with a huge budget and basically takes what um, does it like a film production so he goes in and has sets made you know sets up every single little thing in the shot everything is meticulously picked and placed for his shots so we end up with something like this um the lighting is just crazy beautiful but there's a lot of weird things happening here right um what is going on why is there at least one person missing well there's two settings here there's two missing why are they looking down like this the lighting uh look how dark this room is but look how bright their actual faces look composition wise we have framing happening here happening here happening here so we have this triple rectangle framing happening around the woman. Um, every single thing was thought out of. What painting to put right here? What paintings to put here? What should be on the table? Um, and so it, they create this very mysterious and eerie type of photos where there's just something not right going on. Um, again, another one of his where it's just you know, we have this spotlight coming down. And so for this shot, it was meticulous. He lit every single one of these houses just how he wanted it lit. He brings in fog machines to create this fogginess and such. Uh, this one is really weird. I mean, we have a taxi cab parked kind of crazy, you know, in the street. This woman walking out with no shoes. Um, someone still sitting there uh, what is going on i don't know it's it's very mysterious so nature and technology so some photographers um you know this is more of with working with the center for last land use interpretation this was a project about exploring how our abandoned structures um, are going to be used and trying to figure out what can be done to either prevent or reuse these structures. And so this photographer goes out and photographs them. Now this is a, another Another moment, you know, in the last video, we talked about how photography was important for performance art during the Dada period. Now, this is the same thing. These artists aren't actually photographers, but through photography, they're able to share their work. So in this example, um, there was, this one is from a protest they had, but what they did was they made rubber coverings for the protesters' shoes that left messages on the sand. 
And this is a still from a video where they are questioning who is making the, the decisions. These artists are from Puerto Rico. Who is making the decisions about how the land is being used? And the big issue was that um, there was a military base that was doing um, chemical warfare testing in Puerto Rico, and it was on its own little island. But who decided that that island was now going to be given up for chemical warfare testing. So that's what all of their protests were about and they eventually got it closed down. So we can make a difference. Now, this is really interesting. Nancy Burson, she created software to combine faces. And so um, for these first couple, she took multiple celebrities who were considered to be the most beautiful and combined the images to try to find the perfect face, which this combination looks kind of creepy. I don't know if that's just me. <laughs> um, she did it with politicians um, and then she did it for people with the same person, but adding in a different race type of profile and then even with dictators. Now, what's really interesting is how her work has informed life. You know how the FBI, like if there's a missing person and they've been missing for a while and they put out this photo and say, this is what we think this person looks like now. That comes directly from her work. They, the FBI took her software and used it to now help age and find missing people. Okay, this one, these ones are really creepy. <laughs> Questioning genetic mutation and bioengineering in their work. Um, this is a really, really new um, idea in, in art of questioning these things that, you know, we're coming up against um, as science develops and we have to think about the ethical ramifications of what we're doing. So this in a way is bringing, is making us think about these things a little bit more. Exploring identity is huge and, um, you know, as a personal project, if even if it's not for this class, I recommend some type of personal project exploring your identity because it can be very interesting, very opening to find ourselves. Um, so in this case, Yasumasa Morimura creates self-portraits as celebrities and art world icons and he grew up during a time um, right after World War II when American culture was really infiltrating Japan and becoming, you know, and so he as a youth in Japan during this time was just getting infiltrated with all of these ideas of the of West, of the West, of the U.S. coming in. And so as a part of trying to come to terms with that, he does this series where he dresses up like famous celebrities. Um, Nikki S. Lee now, you know, I, I really wonder, I, I want to do some more research on her <laughs> because I wonder how much, how well this would come off nowadays. So she would, um, she would become part of other subcultures. She would go in and dress, hang out, talk with, and then have someone else take her photo with them. Now, something like this, what, I mean, this is basically blackface. So that's why I'm saying like, I don't think this would could come off very well at all. Now she was doing this work in the nineties. Um, and so, yeah, this idea of cultural appropriation comes in, right? Is she, is she um, doing this? Is she culturally appropriating? Or is this because she's trying to figure herself out and figure out her own identity? Where is the line? Did she cross it? I don't know. Um, so here's another one where she becomes an old lady. Um, this is where she's a chola skater, um, <laughs> redneck. And I mean, and I all, I also wonder about these images, like do the people that she's being photographed with, do they know what this is about? I don't know. I, I feel like it, this would, I don't know. I'm not going to make assumptions, I guess. Um, drag queens. And this is a very recent example. Um, this is 
wonderful work by Joshua Rashad McFadden where he is trying to give voice to his subjects and he, what he does is he photographs them he asks them about his role their role models and has them write about ideas of black masculinity so um he comes in and he's combining these three different things so he's shooting portraits he's scanning the portraits of the people who are their role models and then um, asks them to write their own piece on it Okay, a little bit of politics. So, um, Rossler combines images of homes from magazines with images of war. And so this is kind of to express how we compartmentalize these different things. Although there, we know there are people on the other side of the world or not even the other side of the world, not far from us, who are um, going through extreme hardships, who are having to run from their land, who are in the middle of wars, um, we are still able to keep going on in our life. And in fact, we go on with our, you know, uh, she's putting these images of war with these very consumer type of images, right? Look at my nice couch. Oh, but look, there's people being arrested. Um, <laughs> look at my new sheet and my beautiful dress. But underneath it all, there's this war happening. So um, how do we move along with our lives knowing that there's such horrific things happening and at the same time we're looking to go buy a next couch. Uh, and the Gorilla Girl, some of my favorite. They continue to question the art world to this day. Um, and they are always doing talks, they do protests, um, they're very active in the art world, and they, they're really a lot of, about questioning why women are not, um, are not considered or not part of larger art institutions. So this is one of their most famous works. Do women have to be naked to get into the Met Museum? Less than 3% of the artists in the modern art sections are women, but 83% of the nudes are female. So they're saying, what, there's no women artists out there? You can't include women artists um, unless they're nude. Then they get included as pieces of art. Great question. Okay, so this is just such a small, small sampling of the many artists and artworks that are happening right now today. Like I said, it's such an exciting time to be alive and see all of this happening. Um, there are, I've included a bunch of videos on contemporary art. Um, like I said earlier, some people hate contemporary art and a lot of it has to do because it's not, you know, you look at it and you just don't, get it right away. And that's okay. Um, when I go into a gallery or museum and I see something and my first reaction is, ugh, I stop myself and I say, why do I feel this way? And I look at that art and I really start to think about what is going on and what the person was trying to say. Um, and I often, you know, doing this isn't necessarily about hating on an artist or whatever. It's more about learning about ourselves. So the more we learn about ourselves, the better we'll be able to communicate our own ideas and creative visions. So there are a bunch of videos here. Some of them are on the side of not liking contemporary art. Some of them are on the side of explaining contemporary art. Um, it's a really interesting conversation that's going on. So yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff here. If you're interested in this, I would definitely recommend come back here and watch some of these great, great um, <laughs> videos. It'll really get you thinking even further. All right, guys. So I know that was a lot to take in. Um, so I definitely recommend coming back to this web page and um, going back to whatever sections maybe drew you or really caught your attention.